Um, so hello, yeah, I'm Katie Roberts from the BBC, and I'm here today to talk to you about dismantling monoliths and how at the BBC we've been using microservices and continuous delivery to do just this. So first off, a little bit about me. Um, I've been a developer for over 10 years now. It's more than that, but I don't like to give the exact number because then you can work out my age. Um, I became a developer by accident. Um, I was working at Teesside University in the north of England, and I was uh, put in an office with a young man who would only talk about programming and Phil Collins. So I learned about programming because I wasn't going to learn about Phil Collins for anybody. Um, I've been working at the BBC for four years now. I originally joined the BBC as a JavaScript developer. I was working on um, IPTV or smart connected TVs and I worked on the BBC Sport application for the 2012 Olympics and then later on I worked on the BBC News and BBC Music events um, for connected TVs and now I'm working as a development lead for the BBC Knowledge and Learning. Um, BBC Knowledge and Learning are, are one of the teams within the BBC. Um, the BBC has a remit to educate, entertain and inform and knowledge and learning kind of covers the educate side of it. Um, we create websites for um, Bite Size, BBC Food, BBC Arts, uh, BBC Earth Science and Religion, and we also um, run the Microbit project. Um, the team of full stack developers, um, and a little bit more about the BBC. So the BBC you might know for um, world-class programs such as Doctor Who, uh, natural history programs with uh, David Attenborough, um, BBC World Service and BBC Sport. Um, but we also have a, a large software division as well. And although I program in a number of different languages, I only speak English, so sorry about that. Okay, so software development at the BBC. Um, we've got many different teams, like I said. We've got BBC iPlayer, BBC News, BBC Sport, and BBC Children's. There, there must be nearly 2,000 um, developers working for the BBC uh, across a number of different locations. So we've got... Um, the London offices, the um, Salford offices, which is near Manchester, where I'm based. Um, there's Glasgow, which is uh, where half of the knowledge and learning team is as well. And also we've got teams in Cardiff and Birmingham. Um, we work on a lot of large projects um, with a large number of different development languages. So um, we've got uh, products in PHP, Java, um, JavaScript, Ruby, Scala, and more recently, we're trying to move across to using more Node.js. Um, we've got a large amount of legacy code. We've, BBC Online has been around as a product for 19 years now, and, and with that comes a, a lot of legacy. Um, and we've got really big audience numbers, so um, my products are considered to be quite small with only 2 million unique users per week. Um, but you've got something like BBC Sport, which goes up to 18, 20 million users a week, possibly more now the Euros is on. And we've got a lot of experience at the BBC with delivering content to live audiences. So why would we want to move to continuous delivery? So we've got a lot of content. And as you can imagine, with that amount of content, we also understand the pain of live releases and what they can cause. Um, in the past, I've worked on teams um, where we've been working on big projects, such as the BBC Music Events project, and we've been working in a very scrum and agile way, or at least the development team have been. Um, so you look at the team as a whole, and you realize it's much more of a sort of water scrum fall um, delivery team. So the UX team are throwing over the designs to the development team. The development team are working on features. They're working on features, and every two weeks, they push those features out to the QA team. So we're throwing it over the wall to the QA team. The QA team are then trying to find bugs with our work. But meanwhile, we've moved on to the next feature. And um, they find bugs. We haven't got time to fix it. We start creating a backlog of bugs. Um, the end product of that is that we end up with something which is lower quality than we'd like, because we're the quality of our product is starting to degrade with every bug that we're creating. And so we go from something like this. So up at the top there is our product vision, a beautiful cake pop that looks like a, a chicken. And it's kind of like a chicken. And it was out to live on time. But it isn't really matching what the product wanted to start off with. And this is the pressures when you've got to get things out to live very quickly. So when we've got events like Glastonbury or the 2012 Olympics, you, you have to make sacrifices somewhere along the way to ensure that your product is out to live by the time you need it. Alternatively, if you don't have the pressures of a product going out with a deadline, you can end up with 
you spend so much time polishing that product, getting it right, that by the time it actually gets out to the live market, it's not what the audience wants anymore. Um, so we moved across to a more continuous delivery model. So what is continuous delivery? Continuous delivery is a software de development discipline where you build your software in such a way that the software can be released at any time. So practically, that means we always keep our master branch in a releasable state. Um, the software is developed in a little and often way, so we develop small features where there's much, much lower risk of, of, of errors being made. And if we do find errors and bugs in our code, we know what caused those errors and bugs because they're small features. We do small slices, they're easier to understand, for the team to understand, and they're easier for us to estimate. Um, our teams work together as a unit now. We have our UX development, test, and product team all working together in collaboration rather than overwalling um, designs and requirements. And because we're constantly delivering to our audiences, we're able to get our feedback quicker. So for example, um, say I've got this idea that um, on my website it would be really nice to have a, a little question and answer bit. So you say, uh, my favorite food is um, sausages, yes, no. And you, 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 I want to know as a product owner if this is something that, that the audience want. I can spin something up really quite quickly with just a, a basic uh, JSON file that it's reading from using kind of a smoke and mirrors approach, and I can get that out to a live environment very, very quickly. Then we can look at the stats that we're getting on that question panel to see if, if people are using it. If people are using it, we can see value to the user. If we can see value to the user, it's worth us putting more development time into making that a, a, a real piece of software rather than just done with smoke and mirrors. Um, and because we're constantly getting content out to the market, and we're constantly doing this, we've got a much less stressful way of, of working, which means we've got a much happier team. Um, so we operate a continuous integration environment, which means every push to master can be a release to live, which means that our release pipeline can look a bit complicated. So this is our release pipeline that I created with one of our content development partners recently for the Bite Size app. Um, you might not be able to read everything on it, but over here we have um, when a feature is ready for development, and over here we have it going to the audience to going to live. Um, within each of these areas, if I can use the laser pointer, there we go, um, we've got entry and exit criteria on each of the panels, which means that the, in order for the feature to pass through to the next gate, it has to meet certain criteria that we have set. Um, and these, these criteria can be, for example, that all tests, all unit tests have been written, all the code has been reviewed, that the, um, the feature has been demoed to UX or product, so that we know that what we're getting and what is what we're expecting. And when we release it, we've got confidence in it. Um, all the features, before they get put into our ready for, ready for development content comma, column, excuse me, uh, are amigoed, which means they're talked about with the UX development test and product team and to fully understand the behavior that we're trying to drive out with this feature. So we're using behavior driven design to do that. And we're capturing the behavior in Gherkin, which documents the code, but it also provo provides a format for um, if we want to automate our behavior tests with something like Cucumber, we can use the Gherkin that we've created during these Amigo sessions. Um, when we development starts, when a ticket is picked up, um, tests are written before the code usually. I'd like to think they always are, but and it's done in collaboration with the testers. So the developers have the onus on looking after the tests. Um, we've got small features, which means small changes, which means we can regularly check our code into source control, which in our case is GitHub. Um, every time we do a pull request to the master branch, um, we run unit and integration and behavior tests on our um, int integration CI environment in Jenkins. Um, and if any tests fail during that, that piece of code does not get to go into master. And we have build monitors all around us where we work so we can see radiance of state, so we can see how those um, tickets are moving and if any builds are broken at, the t uh, at any given time. Um, if a build is broken, development stops and somebody goes and fixes the build. Um, tests are run when the code moves across to another environment. So when it moves from int to test, tests are run again. And this helps us to eliminate environmental factors in bugs. And bugs are treated as first class citizens. If we find a bug in the code, so if our, our QA team finds a bug, 
it's treated as a first class, first class citizen. We do not keep a backlog of bugs. We work on our bugs as they're, they're raised. Um, we triage our bugs. We determine whether or not it's um, something we want to fix or something that products are happy to live with. If they're happy to live with it, it doesn't get raised again. It's forgotten about. If it's something we're going to live with, if we're not going to live with and we've got to fix it, we determine whether or not it will block the release or if it can be just worked on as a non-blocking um, fix, and then we work on it and fix it. Um, because we put quite a lot of effort into the writing of unit tests up front and, and having all our tests running in the different environments, our QA and release phase collapse because every release to master is considered a release candidate, so we don't have to run as much testing in there. And we're working together as a fully agile team. Um, we aim to take less than a week for a feature to go in from ready to development to live. So as soon as it starts, it should be in development for no more than two days. Um, if it is in development for more than two days, there's a good chance that that feature was too big to start off with. Um, then we hope to get it out to live as soon as possible. We release little and often, so um, we don't. We, we may have two or three releases a day, um, possibly more. Um, we have work in progress limits. Um, developers are not allowed to start working on new pieces of work until they finish their previous piece of work. This stops you from getting um, one developer sitting on four or five features um, and ensures that they're, they're working and finishing work and that work is going to live. And we prioritize keeping our software deployable over writing new features. So as I said, we release little and often. How are we managing to do that? So, Previously, with, in the BBC, we had a big server farm called uh, Forge. I'm calling it that because it will be on some, some uh, slides later on. And we had a little control over the releases. Um, the releases, we, we'd package up our RPMs and give them to our operations team. And the operations team would then schedule them for a deploy out. Um, and you'd, you'd wait in the queue, and you'd hold your breath, and you'd hope everything was OK. So um, many products were going to live on this platform as well. So if you had a product in front of you which broke the platform, your release was delayed. If you had uh, a major event on, for example, the election or the um, Euros, uh, so the, the, the Euro 2016, the football, um, that would block being able to release on the Forge platform. So you, you were under, at the whim of other teams for getting out your own code. So we moved over to a development operations model where our development team now sets up and maintains their stacks on um, Amazon Web Services. So why do we choose Amazon Web Services? Well, this is a BBC decision was made to use AWS and other cloud services that are available. But the benefits that we found are that it's, we've, we've now got to a stage where it's so easy for us to release, it's a button press. That's it. It's flexible. We can scale up and down, which means that there's a cost benefit to us. We're not paying for boxes we're not using in a basement somewhere in, in the middle of London. Um, our development team control the releases to live, so our test team actually control our, our releases. And our test team, as soon as they are happy with uh, a feature, they release it to live there and then. Um, and we release so often that we don't celebrate. It's become boring. Um, some days we're doing three or four releases a day. There's no point in celebrating that. It's just another thing we do. And with great power, though, comes great responsibility. And we have to monitor what we're doing. So I thought I'd show you some graphs, because I love graphs. Um, this is a graph that is for the Einstein um, service, which powers the Byte Size app, which I'll talk more about later. Um, you can see there are some spikes here, which correspond to some TV advertising we had. Um, for the Bite Size app, and you can see uh, students suddenly going and downloading the app to see what it's like. Um, and that one was particularly before EastEnders program. Um, we monitor those sorts of things. And this is another example of some monitoring. This is um, a, an example of where our service is scaled up as the result of uh, ordinarily we, we were running out of about 500 requests. And we suddenly doubled up, well, we went up to about 6,000 requests on this day. And you can see that AWS, just we increased the number of boxes that we had um, as we needed them. We feathered back down when we didn't. So we, we were only using the, um, the servers for the time we needed them. Um, we don't just monitor our, our own content. We monitor all our other things, as, all our upstream content as well. So we monitor everything so we know what's going on. So if my site breaks because a, a our 
service that delivers our, our video platform content has fallen over, I know where that's happened and I'm, I'm able to say, right, okay, we don't have to do work, but they do and we need that fixing. Um, our development team are also our operations team, so uh, we do have a mobile phone which goes around the team and we go on call uh, once every couple of months to support the product overnight. Um, this helps keep the quality of our code high because nobody wants to be the person who's called out at three o'clock in the morning and having to fix everything. So um, in the time that I've been in um, knowledge and learning, which has been over a year now, we've never had that phone ring once. So it just goes to show that it does keep the quality of the code high. So in summary, for us, continuous uh, <laughs> deployment means running all tests on deployment, continuous integration into the um, Jenkins environment, all our products in version control, and running a development operations team. So that's all great, but it's much more fun to have a case study to see how these things have been working. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about BBC Food. Um, BBC Food started life on BBC Digital over 16 years ago. Um, to give you a bit of context around that, BBC iPlayer has been around for nine years and BBC Online generally has been around for 19 years, like I said. Um, it gets around two million unique users per week. Um, this goes up during times when people need to cook more. So for example, over Christmas and Easter, we see a higher value of higher level of traffic. And over um, Shrove Tuesday or Pancake Day, we go up to about 100 requests per second on the site. Um, we've got a database of 11,000 recipes, and it was a monolithic code base. Um, so a bit before I go on and, and talk about monolithic code bases, I just want to say that there's a bit of disclaimer. Not all monolithic code bases are bad. Um, mo most of them, for the most part, do an excellent job and have been doing it for a long time. Monolithic architectures fall into problems when they start to encompass new functionality or different functionality, jobs that they were never conceived for doing. Um, or there's another problem when they're not they're, they're doing a job, but nobody documented it. Nobody really understands what it's doing anymore, and that person's moved out of the building. Um, and they don't necessarily scale in a way that you want them to. They can be a victim of their own success, um, which Amazon found out in the early 2000s. Um, so this is how I see monolithic code sometimes. Um, you can have it as a towering block of monolithic code that has existed since the dawn of time, or at least before anyone in the company knows how has worked on it. It's got content bolted on, it's got tightly coupled software, and it isn't where we want to be with scalable, maintainable, reliable systems. Plus, monolithic cloud bases don't work well with a continuous delivery model. Um, you have to wait for all the parts of this monolith to be ready before you can then shift it onto the new environment. And that can cause problems as well because it very, makes it very, very difficult to see tightly coupled software where the problems are. This is what we want to move towards. This is how cloud computing looks in my head. Um, this is a series of beautiful microservices doing their jobs in a cloud world, and they're not coupled to anything, and they, they can scale when they need to. Um, so the food product, it, it wasn't as bad as the, the, some monolithic architectures, but it had been around for six years. Um, it was written in PHP, been around for six years, for what it was, it was good code, but it had some elastopax fixes on it since it was originally made, and it had no tests in it, which made it very, very difficult to change the, the functionality of the code without knowing that you were, with the confidence that you weren't breaking something else. But everything works, so why change at all? Um, well, the first and most important thing is that when this was first made, it was made in a time when people didn't really have mobile phones and tablets. So six years ago, that wasn't a problem. But now, most people, when they're cooking in the kitchen, don't have a computer in there. They have their tablet or their mobile, and they're working from that. And this wasn't a responsive design. Um, it had a very, very basic uh, mobile CSS, which worked on device detection. Um, but it wouldn't work on phablets or tablets. So it was a fairly poor user experience. Um, there were we were decommissioning some services. Um, the BBC wasn't going to be able to provide this, this content for us anymore, and we were going to have to find new ways to deliver it. Um, there was old-fashioned design in it, um, a beautiful uh, JavaScript accordion there. That it's just not the way that we do things as much anymore. And 
we've got old implementation of the way that we're running things. These are, this isn't the best way to run a video. Um, we need better ways of doing it now. Also, the BBC is moving to a more personalized world. So when you've got a PHP site like uh, we had with the food site, it relies very heavily on varnish caching. Um, so it, it gets its data, it caches its data, it, and it, it, it stores that data for a long time. In an increasingly personalized world, that becomes very, very difficult to do. And you stop being able to, to guarantee that you're going to get good um, load times up for your product. So where did we start? Well, we knew we were de decommissioning certain um, services, and we have very hard deadlines that we have to stick to. And we have a requirement to get off these services. So let's look at a specific example. OK, so um, the BBC Key Value Store. Um, we know it's being decommissioned. We know what it is. It's a couch DB. Um, do we know what it does? To be honest, nobody really knows anymore. Um, it's been around for a long time. Again, the people who built it uh, have left, and we, there, there are no documents on, on it. But we do know it's going away, and we do know that the food product relies on it, and we do know that we can't use, we can't start rewriting the food product because of the way that the code base is. We can't go in and start making major changes to it to, in order to, to save it. So, and any changes we make must be invisible to our user because we've got a large user base who we don't want them to see any changes that are happening. So what do we do? Right. These are our, our two websites that use um, the BBC KV, Key Value Store. So we've got our PHP front-end application, which is the main users, and then we've got our admin application, which is where our editorial staff go in and add new recipes, etc. So from that, first thing I did was um, started writing a lot of uh, echo statements in the, um, in the front-end PHP code, and from that I was able to see how the, the front-end was getting content for the, from the key value store. And then I did the same for the admin application. And so we were able to get a, a good picture of how the two products, the two existing products, were using the key value store. And once we had that information, we've got a data schema, and we can start recreating it. So um, we chose to use DynamoDB because we've got a, an aspiration to move into the cloud so that we can um, control our own services. Um, DynamoDB is a non-SQL AWS managed service, which worked really well with the product that we were going to build with Node.js, but it doesn't work well with PHP. Um, and we wouldn't be able to make it work well with PHP without making significant changes. So what we decided to do was create a shim layer between the database and the old application. And this would translate the requests and transform them into something that would be compatible with the new database. So introducing Heston. Heston is a Node.js uh, service, um, which is on AWS. Heston is named after the famous TV chef Heston Blumenthal, who is known for taking ingredients and translating them into something else. Um, it intercept, so what we initially did was we used Heston, and we intercepted the events from the food admin app. Um, and Jewel wrote them via Heston to the DynamoDB. Um, and we were able to, because this was a controlled environment with relatively low traffic, we've only got eight editorial staff who are um, using the Food Admin app. We were able to look at this in some detail and, and also inform them of when we were doing things. So if there were any changes, it wasn't going to disrupt them. Once we'd got that working and we were happy with the way it worked, we started looking at the, the just getting the admin application to just read from the Heston service. So it was still right into the KV store, but it was reading from DynamoDB. Once we'd, we were happy that that was working, we started switching things over. So we switched over the, the food um, main application on test to use the Heston service. And then we ran a load test, checking that the caching that we'd put in front of uh, Heston was going to handle 2 million users a week. And when we were happy with that, we were able to um, move on. And our audience never knew anything had changed. Um, then when we started working on the food responsive site, which was a, a Node.js site as well, we were able to use Heston because we already know that this is able to protect the DynamoDB from any caching issues. So. Now the content. 
So um, I've shown the chocolate cake recipe a couple of times now. Um, just out of interest, how many, how many chocolate cake recipes do you think there are on the BBC Food website? 300? That's actually quite close. It's 245. Um, so we've got a, a very loyal user base of uh, food users. Um, so so we, when we were doing this work, we wanted to do what we call a no more tears approach. The no more tears approach was developed by our children's team in Salford um, for when they were working on the BBC children's applications. Um, the, the problem they've got is kids between the ages of four and seven don't want to see things moving around on a web page because they've just learned how to use the web and they don't want things to change a lot. So when you're putting in, when you're refreshing a page, you have to keep the content in pretty much the same place. And it turns out that when you're building a site for 40 to 60 year olds, which is the target demographic for BBC Food, it's about the same. They don't like change. Uh, so the first thing we did was uh, we refreshed the mobile CSS. We, we, we changed some of the fonts. We increased some of the spacing so that it was starting to fall in line with what our new design would be. And then what we did was um, we started a run alongside approach, um, which meant we were going to change the, pay, the, the food website route by route rather than big bang, here you go, new product, off we go. So we started um, looking at uh, the, the BBC Food recipes first because it was the highest value content. It's the one that most of our users go to and it gets most of the traffic. So it would give us um, good feedback as to, how many, uh, as to how users felt about the new site. So this is what our UX did. They, they made it, they're very sympathetic to the old design. Um, none of the old features have disappeared. We've just changed the, the, a, a little bit of the look and feel. And we've got new capabilities underneath, so we can do other things now. We can start thinking about doing A-B testing. Um, plus, we've also got a fully responsive site, which means it works better on tablets and mobile. Um, but this problem, it, the problem with this approach is that it didn't work with our continuous delivery model that I described earlier. We couldn't take away, we couldn't release little and often with a new food um, recipe page because that would have taken features away whilst we were still working on new features. So we used a slightly different approach. Um, we created something called the style guide. The style guide is where all of the components for the site live. So. The style guide exists on the BBC Food site. If I actually switch this now, I should be able to. Okay. So, this is the BBC Food style guide, and you can go to it by just going to bbc.co.uk slash food slash style guide. Um, in here, we've got a list of all the components that have been created, and as the components were created, we were able to push those out to live. All of these components are driven by dummy data, um, I'll come back to this bit in a second. Um, so that it was it was good for you, for tests to be able to use as well because they could run their um, their automated tests against this because they knew that the data was always going to be correct. It's fully responsive, so oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. There we go. You can see it across all the different breakpoints. It works. Um, and up the top here, we've got some useful little features. So we've taken all the fonts that we use within the site and put them in the style guide as well so they can be seen. So uh, a new designer coming to this product can see, oh, we've already got these fonts. These are the fonts we use on this product. This is how we use this product. And we've got a palette of colors that are already used within the, in the, within the product, which is trying to prevent things like this. These are the legacy colors from the old site. And you can see they're all basically the same, very, very similar whites, um, which don't add a huge amount of value to the site. So having this here has helped us to prevent that from becoming uh, bloated with the number of colors um, that we have to serve up. There's also another useful little tool here. So it's got this thing called the gel overlay. Gel is the global experience language which um, the BBC are developing now for all our design patterns. So all of our um, BBC sites will be gel compliant. Um, the idea is that they, um, 
when you go to a BBC site, it will use the same fonts, it will have the same layout, it will, it will conform to the same grids. Um, and that means that you, when you have the gel layout up, you can see how each of the components that we've created fits within the, the layout. Okay. So, go back here. Lost my mouse, sorry. There we go. Okay, so once we've got all the component building blocks for the page, uh, we can start building them up um, and releasing and, and, and creating our responsive um, recipes page. And then once we've got that, we can start building up other pages as well. Um, so the methods that we've used on the food site uh, are an example of, of the strangler pattern. So the strangler pattern is named after the strangler fig. The strangler fig is a, a tree that grows in the rainforests in um, the central zone. Um, the strangler fig starts off as a little seed in the tree. It grows down. It puts root tendrils into the, the ground and starts stealing the nutrition from the ground for, from the original tree that it was on. And because it's now got nutrients and it's, it's getting stronger, it starts building bigger leaves. And once its leaves are there, it starts basically killing off the old tree. So what you're left with is a new tree that was surrounded the old tree. And that's kind of what we're doing with the code here. You're gradually creating a new system around the edges of the old system and slowly letting the old system die as it gets less and less responsibility over time. It's becoming strangled. Um, OK, so, well, that's great, but as some of you might know, um, BBC Food is, is going away completely. So I thought it might be nice to actually show you a different example, something else, another time where we've, we've applied the same pattern. So uh, BBC Bite Size. BBC Bite Size is um, it's the educational content for students in um, the UK from, from the ages of 5 to 18. It has a lot of content on, on the, the, it's been going for 10 years. It's one of the flagship products in the BBC portfolio. It, it, provi it provides all our learning content for um, the, the younger age ranges. It's um, used by 82% of all 15 to 16 year olds when they're doing their major exams in the summers. Uh, and during that time, we, we can pull in like 3.3 million use, unique users across this time. Um, we've got a lot of data in this system. So as you can see up here, we've got a variety of different key stages, um, different types of exams that you can do. Um, there, there's more than this as well. You can have it in different languages. Um, the different nations have different languages, have different exam boards, have different exam types. Um, and it can be quite difficult because once you've gone in there and you found something that you like, you have to bookmark it, otherwise you can maybe not find it again. So because the, the, the site is so vast. So what we um, decided to do as knowledge and learning is to create um, a bite-sized companion app. The companion app would um, be very, very personalized to the user and the user would be able to um, determine, to say which nation they were studying in what exam boards they were studying, um, what language they wanted their content in, and then they'd be able to choose the subjects they were studying and, and then go through um, revision type content and do little tests um, to see how they were doing. So the problems we had were that we we're transforming the existing data into something that the mobile app can understand. So we've got a lot of data. How are we going to get that into a small mobile phone? Um, we don't want to be calling for lots and lots of data all of the time because when you've got um, students age 15 and 16, they don't want to be using their data allowance for you know schoolwork. Um, they want to be um, using it for fun stuff. So we had pressures on the amount of data we were pushing into the phone, and we also had time pressures. Um, it had to be out before the start of the exam season, so we had uh, only 12 weeks to build the app in. So. Um, because I love architecture diagrams, you get to see some more. Um, this is how the current BBC Bite Size um, web page works. It gets data from a number of different sources. It um, takes them into the PHP layer, and it transforms them into the web pages. Um, 
this is what we want. We've got our um, mobile user here. Um, they can't hope to, do, to process the data in the same way. Um, we wouldn't want to do that anyway, because we'd then have to also create data processes for both iOS and Android devices. So um, we created something called Einstein. Einstein is a, uh, another Node.js service which uh, is on AWS. It also has another hilarious name. The BBC have a, a, a bad habit for naming everything. So this is all science, um, famous scientists for the Bite Size app. Um, the problems facing Einstein is that it's still got to get all that data. It's creating a beautiful JSON object for, for our, our, our mobile app, but it still has to get all the data from elsewhere in order to do that. So we use a service called Morph. Morph is a BBC templating engine that has been created uh, initially by the BBC Sport team, but now is used by a number of different teams. And it allows the aggregation of data from multiple sources. Um, and it also gives us a massive benefit because it's really, really highly cached. So we can cache our content, we can get it into Einstein, and we can get our data quickly. So we've got a good, speedy response to our mobile user who's not having to download a lot of data to get that speedy response. Um, so the next thing we have to worry about is how do we personalize this content? So again, BBC has a service called My BBC, so we use the, the app go, calls out to My BBC to get um, a, a token um, so they can then talk to UAS, where user, UAS is the user activity service, and the user activity service stores what the user has stored as preferences, so whether I'm studying in Ireland and I want my language to be Gaelic and I've got this particular exam board that I'm studying and these are my subjects, that all gets stored in the UAS code. Um, problem with the UAS, with UAS is it doesn't store full content because if it stored full content it would bloat very, very quickly. So what we had to create um, was another little service. This little service is called Newton. Newton um, takes content from the user activity service and it hydrates it with content from the Einstein um, service, which and then presents that back to the applications, the, the mobile applications, so um, the user gets a full experience. Um, and it's a nice little service-based architecture. Um, we've got high availability because we don't want this this um, 500 in during exam time because uh, students get very very vocal about things like that on Twitter. We get a lot of. Um, this, this app has literally saved my life, or this lap, app has literally ruined my life, coming through on Twitter quite a lot about this. Um, but yeah, well, where can we go next from this? Well, we're already getting all the data, so how about if we try to use that data to start powering our, our PHP front end? That would be pretty cool. Um, and then maybe we could reduce that PHP front end from, from being a very large, um, transforming engine to just maybe just a little view model. But you've got to be careful, because suddenly Einstein's becoming another monster. It's becoming another huge monolith that's doing more than it needs to. So what you could do instead is possibly think of another service that does a similar thing to Einstein. Maybe it extends Einstein, but it provides content for the, ser for the area that it needs, rather than one, ser one service trying to do too many things. Which kind of brings us back to our, our nice services in the cloud, where small microservices are beautiful. So our monoliths may not be completely gone. Um, it's going to take a while to get rid of them completely. But they have reduced in complexity. We're slicing off the features from them, and we're creating microservices that can take the strain and, the, and slowly strangling the, the, the monoliths out of existence. OK. Thanks very much. Uh, are there any questions?